The American military has been the guarantor of world peace since World War II. Despite talk of the evils of American militarism, the reality is that World War III has been prevented by American hegemony. No country would take on the United States directly, and no alliance could form sufficient to take on the United States and its allies directly. Furthermore, global prosperity is a direct result of American military predominance. Freedom of commerce is the first precondition to international prosperity, all of which means the world runs thanks to American gunpowder. It has since the decline of the British Empire. And now America's military is in trouble, serious trouble. In particular, there are five problems facing America's military. One, international dependency. In the aftermath of World War II, the United States was forced by circumstance to assume the role of the world's policemen. It wasn't our choice, it was just reality. Every other major state on the world stage had been devastated by World War II. We were the last ones left standing. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was rising in the East and the West required protection. So the United States filled the breach. The US paid a disproportionate share of the military budget of the world because the US represented by far the largest share of the world economy. GDP is a rough statistic, but the United States represented some one third of all global GDP as of 1985. Today, that share is down to 25% or so. Yet the US military spending represents approximately 40% of all global military spending. International dependency on American military might can lead to a vicious cycle. When the American economy declines, we spend less on the military. Our global opponents take advantage, increasing their own military budgets and generating more conflict. We then have to spend more in order to forestall that conflict this bleeds our economy, which leads to domestic turmoil and increased calls for reducing America's military budget. In reality, the Cold War mentality held by many of our Western allies, a mentality that says we ought to foot the bill for their defense needs, needs to end. The United States spends approximately 3.5% of its GDP on defense. The UK spends just 2.2%, France 1.9%, Australia 1.9%, Germany 1.4%. It's time for other countries to pick up their fair share. Two. Naval underinvestment. When it comes to war making and ensuring freedom of trade, it's the US Navy that does the heavy share of the lifting. Yet the Navy represents just 22.5% of our annual military budget, lower than both the Army and the Air Force. As historian Paul Kennedy writes, the United States became the predominant naval power on the planet during World War II. In 1938, we had 380 active ships. By 1944, we had over 6,000. We never gave up that predominance, but right now, 90% of global merchant ships are built in China, Japan, and South Korea. The US Navy keeps talking about growing while shrinking, relying on better technology to make up for lack of ships. The United States has fewer operating naval carriers today than it did four decades ago. The Chinese have the world's largest Navy with 355 ships, and they want to add 70 more ships by 2030. The United States still has the world's predominant blue water Navy, meaning naval capacity that spans deep oceans, as opposed to green water navies, meaning coastal defense, and brown water navies, meaning policing generally confined to domestic areas. China, by contrast, only has regional power projection, but China may not need more than that if the United States continues to cut off her own fleet, and China is gaining. As Admiral Charles A. Richard, commander of U.S. Strategic Command said in 2022, as I assess our level of deterrence against China, the ship is slowly sinking. It is sinking slowly, but it is sinking, as fundamentally they are putting capability in the field faster than we are. As those curves keep going, it isn't going to matter how good our operating plan is, or how good our commanders are, or how good our forces are. We're not going to have enough of them. And that is a very near-term problem. In the South China Sea, in particular, the balance of power may already have shifted. After all, Taiwan is a footstep from China, but an ocean away for the United States. It's not enough for the United States to outmatch China generally. The US has to be able to project power in specific areas in China's own backyard to challenge China's threats to supply chains and other nations. Three. Technological problems. The United States military is by far the most technologically sophisticated fighting force on the planet, but that advantage is gradually dissipating. According to Christian Bros, author of The Kill Chain, the United States has developed antiquated battle networks. The military has a built-in bias against allowing the private sector to innovate. The Pentagon should reimagine its requirements process as a series of defined end states and let real innovators in America's private sector figure out how to get there. As Admiral William Owens and Governor John Kasich write, quote, Countless studies and recommendations for change have flowed from the Pentagon and Congress in recent decades. But few of these reforms have materialized because a weak oversight structure and a military industrial culture that often continues to invest in outmoded systems with the encouraging support of Congress. Four, recruitment problems. The US military has been an all volunteer force since 1973 when the United States ended the Vietnam War draft. 
The problem is that now, there just aren't enough people who are either willing or able to serve. According to the Pentagon, 77% of all young adults in the United States are unfit for service. The Pentagon found, quote, when considering youth disqualified for one reason alone, the most prevalent disqualification rates are overweight, 11%, drug and alcohol abuse, 8%, and medical physical health, 7%. Fewer and fewer Americans are even inclined toward military service. Just 9% of young Americans are interested in serving. Private industry offers better pay and better benefits and less risk. According to Marine Lieutenant General David Ottingnon, this isn't just a matter of fat and unmotivated youngsters. It's a problem of institutional trust. Quote, the growing disconnect and declining favorable view between the U.S. population and traditional institutions, labor shortages, high inflation, and a population of youth who do not see the value of military service also continue to strain recruiting efforts and place the Marine Corps' accession mission at risk. Part of the problem is indeed the generalized perception of the military among its usual pool of recruits. Moves toward diversity, equity, and inclusion in the military. Marketing directed toward LGBTQ plus minus divided by sign agenda items and atomistic individualism have undercut the most fertile ground for recruits. Southern recruits have been overrepresented in the military for decades. So have children of military members who represent 25% of new recruits, according to Defense Department data. Conservatives are overrepresented in the military. Why then would the U.S. military turn itself into an outlet for left-wing equity politics? Five, lack of public trust. The politicization of the military has been combined with failures of political leadership, leading to greater and greater distrust of the military itself. This year, American confidence in the military dropped to 60%, the lowest number in two decades. The number of Republicans who expressed confidence in the military dropped from 91% in 2020 to 68% in 2023. This is not a critique of the men and women who serve. It's a critique of military leadership. The horrifying American withdrawal from Afghanistan is first on the list of American complaints about the military. The lies and idiocies expressed by figures like General Mark Milley are a point of contention for millions of Americans. Combine that decreasing trust with economic hardship and Americans aren't in a spending mood. Economic problems domestically generally and understandably foster isolationism at home. This, however, leads to greater international conflict as other countries move to fill the gap left by American military predominance. All of this means that an America able to muscularly defend her interests is in the best interest of both Americans and people across the world. But in order for that to happen, Americans have to decide to support their military and the military has to justify those expectations.